Okay. All right, guys, I think we're ready to kick this off this evening. So um, if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and turn to Matthew, the sixth chapter. That's where we're going to be this evening. Uh, We're continuing through our um, study of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, Our study has been um, entitled Impacting Your World for Christ um, and kind of a little bit uh, different take on the Sermon on the Mount. Um, As we kind of began this study weeks ago now, um, you know, we've, we've been calling this the greatest sermon ever preached, um, recorded in chapters 5 and 6 uh, of, of Matthew. Uh, great, uh, great couple of passages, There's some really powerful uh, stuff in there. But this particular study I love because it seems timely for where we are today, uh, even culturally, I think. Um, but, but the direction the study goes is about how when Jesus came and preached the Sermon on the Mount, how so much of his teaching was revolutionary to the world, in a sense. Not, not in a physical sense, but in a spiritual sense. Uh, he took so much of uh, what was being practiced by religion of that day, uh, through Judaism and, and through the scribes and the Pharisees and the other kind of religious establishment of his day, kind of turned it on its head, essentially. Um, and so in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, we get to see Jesus' teaching, him giving Uh, meaning to uh, so much of what was being taught in his day by religious leaders and really kind of contradicting it um, in some ways. Uh, Remember already in our study we've read where Jesus said, I didn't come to destroy the law, but I came to fulfill it. Um, So he was the fulfillment of all of those things and didn't do away with those things. He just gave it meaning at at what it was supposed to be. And so uh, we've kind of been looking at that uh, over the past uh, few weeks uh, kind of studying that some. Um, we've, we've kind of been um, stating this every week kind of as our um, key kind of launching statement. It's, it's kind of been uh, what we've been saying every kind of week that's kind of the heart of this study. Um, and it kind of starts, says, it says this, and you've kind of got some blanks to fill in there. We've been saying this every week that before you can impact another uh, another person's life, before you can impact the life of another for Christ, um, you must have been impacted by Christ yourself. Uh, before you're going to be able to impact somebody else for the kingdom, before you're going to be able to make a difference in your world for Christ, you have to know Christ personally. Um, and so the first part of the Sermon on the Mount is all about coming into relationship with him, and then it's about the change that he makes in us once we get to know him. So that's kind of been the key launching statement uh, for, our, uh, for our study. And then we've been building on this. This has been building. I think by the time we finish the Sermon on the Mount, you may have close to 20 of these keys for impacting your world for Christ. Uh, we're building on it every week. Um, so tonight we're up to nine, nine important keys for impacting your world for Christ. And, and these are just things that we've already studied already looked at as we've kind of worked through it. And the ninth one is where we're going to be tonight. And let me kind of just give you a direction of where we're going. Um, tonight's topic, in, in the, right in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus begins to talk about prayer. Um, and, and I personally believe this. I think Jesus really kind of put this in where he did because I think it's what he taught. We have so many ex- examples of Jesus praying to the Father. I think prayer is key for the Christian life. It is key. I, I don't think we give enough time to it um, today. I don't think we study it enough. I don't think we dig enough deeply enough into it. I, I think a lot of us kind of, you know, throw little petitions about our needs at God and we call it a day. We call that prayer. Um, I, I, I think prayer needs to be a topic for us today. Um, when I look at the things going on in our world and in our country right now, can I just tell you, I think the key is prayer. I think the key is prayer. Um, when I see things that are happening in the church today, um, I printed an article off today from a Christian magazine that I, I shared with Deborah, and she just went, who is that that wrote? It's, it's six things Christians should stop saying. If I, I was going to bring it tonight and read it to you, it was just the most ungodly, heretical thing I've ever read, and it's being put out by Christian publication. I'm just telling you, as Christians, we need to be in prayer. The church is under attack. Christians are under attack, the family's under attack, our institutions are under attack, and and the only answer is prayer. And so what we're going to do with this study is we're going to kind of camp here for a couple of weeks. I'm going to break this into two parts because 
in this particular part of the Sermon on the Mount. He's going to talk about prayer, and then he's going to give us the model prayer. Um, so we're going to look at it all tonight, verses 5 through 15 in chapter 6. Um, we're going to talk about prayer, but we're going to talk about the first half of it tonight, verses 5 through 8, kind of launch into that. And then the next time we're together, which will be in a couple of weeks, okay, because uh, we're not having services next Wednesday or the next. Um, so it'll be, I'll see you in the new year. It'll be that kind of thing. Um, so we'll start the new year talking about the Lord's Prayer, okay? So two, two times we're going to kind of be in this section of the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus deals with the subject of prayer. So just to kind of let you know. Let, let me give you these things because I think these are important and they're worth repeating every time we're together. This is where we've been so far in our study and these are kind of those nine important keys to impacting your world. I'm giving you all of the ones we've already covered and then the new one for tonight. So if you just kind of look at your page there, you can jump through those first eight pretty quickly um, to impact your world for Christ. You have to know Christ personally. That goes right along with that launching statement that we made a while ago that before you can impact the life of another, you have to know him. And so if you'll remember the Beatitudes, many of you studied the Beatitudes, the Be Happy Attitudes. Remember when we studied that, we talked about how the first part of those is about coming into relationship with him. Okay, second half is about how he changes our relationship with others and with the world. So to impact your world for Christ, you have to know him personally. Then we looked at salt and light and we said that to impact your world for Christ, you must reflect Christ to the world. So once you come to know him, you must begin to reflect him in your life. And the examples that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount are salt and light. Then we talked about how to impact your world for Christ. You have to learn to live by the word. Uh, you have to love the Word, and you have to learn to live by what the Word of God says. Then number four, we talked about how to impact your wor world for Christ. You must rightly relate to others. We talked about how our relationships are important with other people, that um, God places us in places where we can have an opportunity to be a witness for Him, to tell others about Him, to impact the lives of others. Um, then number nine, we talked about how to impact your world for Christ. You have to guard your heart. And that was a very important week as we talked about how the enemy wants to attack the life of a Christian. And so you got to guard your heart. Um, then we talked, number six, about to impact your world for Christ. You have to build strong, Christ-centered marriages and homes. And Jesus spent a section of the Sermon on the Mount talking about the marriage and the home. Um, then we talked about, number seven, to impact your world for Christ. You have to live a life of integrity. That is, your yes has to be yes. Your word should be dependable. You should be trustworthy. You should have those qualities of your life that say, you know, there's something different about that person. There's something different about them. And, and, and so I, th I think that's important. Then number eight, to impact your life for Christ. And this is where we were last week. Um, you have to practice radical generosity. And that was kind of interesting last week where Jesus talked about uh, us practicing radical generosity. If you remember, we tried to kind of get this across. That's not just about money. It's about... It's about a heart that we have towards other people, of being generous towards others, sharing with others, reaching out to them, making our resources, our talents, everything that we have available to him. And so here's number nine, and this is where we're going to be tonight, and then the next time we're together, two, time, two weeks we're going to work on this one. Uh, but to impact your world for Christ, you must become a man or a woman of deep and fervent prayer. So get that one down. I, I just gave you a long, some long blanks there to fill all that in. Um, if you're going to impact your world for Christ, you must become a man or a woman of deep and fervent prayer. Now, you know, we could spend a whole lot of time. There is so much information out there just on the subject of prayer. And, and I, I think, you know, a little bit of introspection here for each one of us and just kind of getting honest about ourselves, like, just some personal kind of inventory questions. How, how healthy really is your prayer life? Don't answer that out loud, but just some personal consideration. How, how much time do you spend daily in deep, fervent prayer? And if the answer to that question is, well, I know I don't spend enough. I know I don't spend enough time. I, I know you know, my prayer life needs to be richer. It needs to be better. I need to devote more time to it. I, you know, I, I need to be able to do, to do, to spend more time with him in prayer. You know, you know, if that's the question, I think that the next kind of question is, how do I do that? I think 
one of the struggles we have sometimes is what does a real healthy prayer life look like? What's, what, is, what's made, what is that made up of? What is, what's God call us to when he calls us to have in this kind of deep, fervent prayer life? And, and, and that's really key. I think one of the most powerful and impactful tools uh, in the arsenal of a Christian is prayer. It's one of the most powerful and effective tools that you have. It is also perhaps one of the most underutilized and undiscovered tools that we have. Um, if most of us were to be honest and really evaluate our prayer lives and what they look like, they look a whole lot like just us giving meager petitions to our wants and wishes for our blessings through the day. That is basically what prayer lives usually look like for, for most people. And I believe that God calls us to something much, much deeper than that. Uh, prayer is such a powerful, important thing. One of the things I want to do tonight is I'm just going to, I want to just kind of begin this kind of section and talk about prayer just with some great quotes about prayer. You'll know I'm Mr. Quote Guy, right? So I love that. Um, Nancy's rolling her eyes at me. <laughs> I, I love that. But, but one of the things that I love to do is, is I, I love reading um, some, of the, some of the great old preachers from way back. Some, some of those who God used to spark revivals and, and God used to bring awakening to our nation. And I like to read stuff from them. And, and I, I guarantee you that one of the things you're going to find 100% of the time is that every one of those movements, every one of those powerful men who God used in a mighty way, you will find prayer fervent prayer behind that happening and today we look at the things that are going on in our country and most of us kind of go what this country needs today is a good old holy ghost revival that's what we need what we really need is another awakening and i'm just telling you that's not going to come apart from praying christians it's not going to come it is not going to come until we begin to really pray and grab hold of what that means to be deep deep prayer warriors so i want to share some of these quotes with you and all of these are from Great prayer warriors, some of these folks wrote volumes on the subject of prayer. Some of them were revivalists and people who God used to spark revival. Uh, the first one I want to share with you is from Billy Sunday. And um, here's what Billy Sunday said. He said, if you are a stranger to prayer, you are a stranger to the greatest source of power known to human beings. Now think about that. If you are a stranger to prayer... And, and by that, I think he means deep, fervent prayer like we're talking about here. If you're a stranger to prayer, you're a stranger to the greatest source of power known to human beings. Uh, now, listen to me, guys. If we have that kind of power at our fingertips, why aren't we using it? Why aren't we using that? If we have that kind of power right at our fingertips, even as little First Baptist Church of Buda sitting back here with a small crowd here tonight, and we see the things that are going on around us, listen, we ought to be fervent on, and, and on our knees in prayer right now. We, we ought to be bathing things in prayer right now when we so, see what's going on in our country. But that's a powerful one. Then E.M. Bounds, I don't know how many of you have ever heard of E.M. Bounds, but he wrote, he's one who wrote volumes on prayer uh, back in the 1800s. And he said this, God shapes the world by prayer. Prayers, he says, are deathless. They outlive the lives of those who utter them. Isn't that pretty powerful? I think that's, that's, that's a great, great statement. He says God shapes the world by, by prayer. Um, and, and so I, th I think, again, that kind of beckons us to be a, a people of prayer today. Andrew Murray is another one who wrote tons on prayer. And he said this, Beware in your prayers above everything else of limiting God, not only by unbelief, but by, fancying that you, by, but by fancying that you know what he can do. Expect unexpected things above all we ask or think. I love that quote. So think about what he's saying there. Let me, let me read it again to you. Beware in your prayers above everything else of limiting God, not only by unbelief, but by fancying that you know what he can do, expect unexpected things above all we ask or think. That's actually what Paul said in Scripture, that he is able to do above, above and beyond what we can comprehend, think, or even imagine. 
And so listen, our prayers, I think, are too small, really, when we ask. Um, he's able to do amazing, amazing things. Um, Edwin Harvey said this, a day without prayer is a day without blessing, and a life without prayer is a life without power. So he's just simply saying, listen, prayer has to be a part of your life. Martin Luther said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. That's huge, isn't it? Oswald Chambers um, just showed me the book from Oswald Chambers that you found. He said this, we have to pray with our eyes on God, not on the difficulties. And I like that statement too. And D.L. Moody said, every great movement of God can be traced to a kneeling figure. And it's true. So, so that's just some, okay? I mean, this could have, the whole study just could have been those kind of statements. But I just want you to understand that every single time God has done amazing things, it's been because his people prayed. And, and I think right now we ought to be leaning into that. We ought to be saying, what, what, what can enhance our church to become this praying body that God is using in a powerful because of the prayers of his people? Dr. Gary Linton said this. He said, the average Christian spends less than 10 minutes each day in prayer. Now think about that. The average Christian, okay, if we're averaging here, the average Christian spends less than 10 minutes each day in prayer. There's probably some folks that spend a little bit more, which kind of begins to say that a lot of us don't spend very much, right? Uh, if it's going to average out to just 10 minutes a day. You have this powerful, powerful tool that taps into the very presence of God, which has been opened for you by the blood of Christ so that you can come boldly before his throne in prayer and you can go anytime you want to and speak to the God who created everything out of nothing by mere spoken word and you're only going to take 10 minutes of his time? That's unfathomable, really. But we've never kind of put it in that kind of understanding. That, I mean, today we see things happening and we, we wring our hands, we fret over all the things that are happening around us and I'm just telling you that the key is prayer. There's power in the prayers of God's people. And so I don't want to miss that. So here's the question I want us to just think about tonight as we're kind of getting started. Uh, because Jesus is going to lay into the subject and he's going to spend uh, quite a bit of time here in verses 5 through 15 of chapter 6, that whole section, he's going to talk about pr the subject of prayer, this powerful, powerful thing. So with all of that said, we've heard how powerful it is. We've heard how it's even done powerful things in our world. We've heard from some great classic preachers of the past and, and kind of leaned into that. We've said if we're going to impact our world, we have to be a people of deep, fervent prayer. So here's the question. Why don't we spend more time in prayer? Let's just talk about it for a second. Why don't we, why don't we pray more? Why, why isn't our prayer life bigger? Why, why don't we pray more? Thoughts? Yes, Kathy? Okay. We get too busy. We just, we just don't make time um, to spend long qualities of time in prayer. I'm going to share some more quotes tonight, of course, if we get to them, um, about that very subject. But um, yes, that's a big one. We don't make time for it. Okay. Anybody else? Thoughts? Why don't we spend, if, if it's so important, why don't we spend more time? Yes, Brother Tandy? I'll come back to you. I'm sorry? Okay. We don't realize the importance of it. We don't, we don't think it's that important. Um, is it? Absolutely. Absolutely it is. Um, if nothing else, study the life of Jesus, and you will study constant times when Jesus, you'll find him in prayer. You'll find him slipping off to be by himself. For times of prayer, you'll find him in prayer, inviting others to join him in that time of prayer. Jesus was a praying man when he set the example for us, so it was important. So what else? Why, why don't we? If, if it's that important, why don't Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. Prayer costs something, doesn't it? it, it it's, it's not entertaining. It's not, yeah, that's good. I think we live in a day like that. Yes, John, you had your hand up too. Okay. We limit how big God is, maybe limit that he even hears us, uh, limit our ability to, for God to use us in, in our prayers, maybe. Yeah, 
all of that kind of covers in that. Other thoughts? Why don't we, why don't we pray? Yes, Marie? That's a very good point, too. Sometimes we think our little concerns are too small, okay, uh, to bring before God. But, but God cares about even the very small things in our life. And sometimes those small things can have a huge impact, can't they? So, it, that's right. And numbers the hairs of our head, the Bible says, so he cares about. <laughs> For some of that, that's getting easier and easier to count. <laughs> Uh-oh. Sorry, brother. Is that why you sit back there at the very back so you can just run out if it gets... <laughs> there you go. There you go. Well, we'll try not to make it too hot tonight. Anybody else? Thoughts about that? Why don't we spend... If, if it's so important, and, and I know probably I share, just shared a whole lot of things that kind of made you go, whoa, wow, wow. I've never thought about prayer like that. I've never thought about prayer being that big of a deal. Maybe it needs to be a bigger deal to me. And so you've never really kind of put it in that kind of a context. Um, but but why, why don't, if it's that big, why don't we, why don't we do it? Okay, don't know how. So we've heard some people just want to be entertained. Yes, Keith? Okay. Okay. Kind of, that kind of plays back into the time thing too. It's, it's not a priority. There's other things that are that seem to have a higher priority. Um, and, and I guess, you know, that's some of what we do in a study like this is kind of reevaluate where something is on our scale of priorities, right? If I'm thinking about that, I'm kind of going, well, maybe prayer needs to be a bigger priority. If it's, if it's that important to Jesus and the world is shaped by prayer, like, uh, you know, some of these great ones of old who God used, and so if, it's, if the world's shaped by, maybe, maybe I don't have, prayer high enough on my list of priorities. Maybe it's not where I need to be um, in some of that. Anybody else have thought, why don't, why don't we pray? Anybody else? Yes. Okay. Okay. I think that's, yeah, most of the time our prayer life gets really serious and we get really overwhelmed, right? Like, but at certain times we think we can handle it. We can, we can take care of this ourselves. We can do it. So we try to do it in the flesh. Um, and our prayer life doesn't often get real serious until all of a sudden, like our backs are against the wall or it's like, God, I can't do this. And then we start crying out to him. Any, anybody else, another thought there before we move on? One of the key things that Jesus said, and it's, it's not in the passage we're looking at tonight, but it's in one of the parallel passages in Luke 8, 1, Jesus said this, and I think this is something that kind of hit me when I was kind of working on this study, kind of read this. Jesus said, men ought always to pray and not to faint for his words and not to faint, or some Bibles say not to cease. So men ought always to pray. And so I think what Jesus is telling us that prayer ought to be a natural flow of the life of a believer. It, it ought to be a part of our life. It ought, it ought to be who we are. We ought to move in and out of prayer conversation with him. And so that becomes really, really powerful. So what I want to do tonight um, is I want to kind of start off with that question. Why don't we pray as we should? You, kind of, you guys have kind of thrown some things at that. And I want to just kind of give you about 10 reasons here that we don't pray, that Christians don't pray as they should. Um, we've already talked about how important it is and what that looks like, but um, why don't we pray? And then, and then Jesus is going to kind of jump into that a little bit um, in our passage um, when we get to that in Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through uh, 15. So let me give you these, these things to you and make some comments about each one of them. We'll move through them pretty quickly. Um, and one of you said this, Tandy, you may have said this. Number one is, we don't believe. Uh, we, we, don't, we don't really believe in prayer. Um, so we say that we do, and we, we know we need to talk to God about it. But, you know, sometimes there's things in our life that have happened. Maybe we've prayed, and we've prayed, and we've prayed, and the heavens have been brass, and God hasn't answered our prayer like we think it should be answered, or, or, or 
or we're just not getting a response, it seems like. There's times when we go through that. Most of us have been there, right? Where we've had something on our heart and we prayed and we prayed and we prayed and we finally concluded God's not going to answer. He's not going to. Remember a couple of weeks ago, um, I preached about um, Zacharias and Elizabeth and how they had prayed and they had prayed and they had prayed. You have to remember that things don't happen in our timing, but in God's timing, right? But, but sometimes when we pray and pray and things don't come, what happens to us? We start to, yeah, that's right. We start to doubt. And so, so sometimes it's because we don't believe. So uh, that's, that's a, a big one. I think Tandy mentioned that. One. Number two is this. Um, we don't pray because our flesh is weak. Uh, weak in the flesh. Mark 14, 38 says this, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I don't know if you've ever meditated on that at all or, or kind of thought about that um, just a little bit, but um, our flesh is opposed to anything spiritual and will fight us all along the way. Um, how many of you have a hard time praying because um, you fall asleep when you're praying? Flesh is weak, right? Or, or you have a hard time praying because you have a million other things you got to get done, and so you, you kind of say a couple quick little prayers and then rush out the door, and prayer isn't one of those most important things to you. So, so that's what we're talking about there is that, that sometimes the needs of the flesh overtake the spirit and we ought to be giving ourselves to spiritual, spiritual things. And that's kind of number three is this, we don't uh, pray sometimes as Christians as we should because we lack spiritual discipline. Um, and we'll talk more about this one tonight because Jesus kind of addresses this as a spiritual discipline uh, in Matthew 6. But we lack spiritual discipline. We may be saved, sanctified, um, but without discipline, we'll never spend quality time with God in prayer. Uh, prayer is a discipline. It, it takes discipline for us to do that, to discipline ourselves, to spend time with Him in prayer. Um, and, and, and I think that's powerful. The psalmist wrote this in Psalm 37, verses 4 and 5, and I love this verse. He said, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. That is a great promise psalm when you look at that. But if you look at that, that's talking about a person who has spiritually disciplined themselves to be in a trusting, committed, walking relationship with him. What does it mean when he says in that verse, delight yourself in the Lord, commit your ways to the Lord? What's he talking about there? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I think that's powerful, isn't it? Uh, many have the desire to pray, but they never get around to it. We may delight in the Lord and desire to spend time with Him, but it takes commitment and discipline if we're going to follow through with that. So that's a powerful one. Uh, number four, a lot of times we don't pray as we should because we've left our first love. Keith, this might have been some of what you're talking about, but the, our priorities kind of get messed up a little bit. We get things kind of out of whack, and Jesus is no longer... Isn't that what Jesus confronted in the church at Ephesus? That, you know, I have this against you. You're doing all these great things for me, but you've left your first love. When Jesus is first in our life, what will we want to do? Talk to him, right? I mean, think about that. Don't you want to spend time with that person that you love the most? Don't you want to just, every moment you want to be around them, you want to converse with them? And I've said this so many times, but you can't have a relationship with someone you never spend time with. And if we've left our first love, it's going to affect our prayer life. Here's number five. Um, we don't spend time in prayers we should because we don't want God to interfere in our life. Now, most of us would never be so bold is to say, is to say I don't want God to interfere in my life. But here it is. Sometimes we're afraid to really trust and put things in God's hand because we're afraid of what the answer might be, right? Well, I don't want to just surrender everything to him. He might send me to Africa. Right? Now, that, I know that's an overstatement, right? But, but you get where I'm going with that, right? There's a million things like that in our life that we can just be afraid God's going to ask me to do it. And that's way past my comfort zone. And I don't know if I want to do it. So we don't spend time in prayer because we don't want God interfering, Right? God, don't make me too uncomfortable. Don't shake me too much out of my comfort zone. Don't make me do something that's kind of not my giftedness, we say. You know, it's not about your giftedness. It's about his ability, right? Uh, I, I believe that 100%. So um, anyway, sometimes we just want to, number six, 
Um, sometimes we don't pray because there's sin in our life. There's sin in our life. John Bunyan, <clears throat> another one who I love. Kathy, I love my big John Bunyan books that I have. John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know if y'all have ever read that, but it's, I love that book. Um, John Bunyan said this, Prayer will make a man cease from sin as sin will entice a man to cease from prayer. Now think about that. If you're spending time with God, what's, it's going to have an effect on your life and how you're living every day. But if you have sin in your life, your prayer life is going to suffer because of it. Um, we know kind of scripture tells us that our sin will impede our prayer life, right? But if you have sin in your life, why might that keep you from wanting to spend time in prayer? That's right. Too uncomfortable, right? Um, God's going God's to step on your toes. He's going to convict you. He's going to begin to deal with you about some things. So that's a powerful one. Um, here's number seven. This is the one that I hate to hear, but it's the truth. Uh, sometimes we don't praise or should just because we're lazy. You know, let's just be honest, right? Sometimes we don't pray as we could because we'd rather have a couple hours of sleep, right? That kind of thing. So sometimes it's just, la it's, it's just laziness if you think about that. Here's something I think we have to understand, and that is that prayer is often laborious. It is. That if, if you really spend time in prayer, laboring fervently over prayer, it's tiring. Um, it can be. You can, you can go into your prayer closet, and it can be a, just a time of battle, a struggle. Um, and so prayer can be exhausting, and, and, and I think we know that. In, in Colossians 4, 5, Paul talks about how we are to always labor fervently in our prayers. That's a pretty powerful thought there. Um, but I think sometimes um, as Christians, prayer takes work. Uh, when you talk about praying fervently, praying earnestly, praying deeply, it means that there's this intensity to your prayer that's spiritually exhausting. And so sometimes we don't pray because we should be lazy. Number eight, sometimes we don't pray because we don't make prayer a priority. Keith, there it says it just like you said a while ago. Um, and, and that is true. Um, we don't have time to pray, or more accurately, we don't make time to pray. Other things take a priority over our prayer life. Um, R.A. Torrey, who was D.L. Moody's right-hand man, and godly, godly man that God used in a tremendous way, uh, to, to bring about great revivals that swept our land. R.A. Torrey, powerful in his own right. He, he, was, he said it like this. He said, we are, too busy, we are too busy to pray, and so we're too busy to have power. We have a great deal of activity, but we accomplish little. Many services, but few conversions. Much machinery, but few results. Do y'all see what he's saying? That what's, what's the key to the power really breaking out in a church what's what's the key really to god beginning to move and work it's prayer it's spending time prayer. and he says listen if if we're too busy to pray and so we're too busy to have the power of god really move among us and and i, I think it's important what he says there he says listen we have services that go on but few conversions why they're not bathed in prayer that, that that's so important so uh, that's a big one so we don't make it a priority number nine <clears throat> we become discouraged in our prayers. Uh, once again, Jesus said in that passage I quoted a while ago from Luke 18, 1, men ought always to pray and not to faint, but we often become faint-hearted in our prayers and grow discouraged. And there's examples of that through Scripture. Uh, you think about uh, the disciples. When Jesus is fervent in prayer and he's asking them to pray with him and they couldn't even watch for him for an hour, right? They, they, they became faint at heart uh, and became discouraged in their prayers. Um, and then number 10, <clears throat> we don't pray as we should because we lack the spirit of prayer. And I think this is a big one. Um, once we become a Christian, the spirit comes to reside inside of us. But, but here it is. I, th I think the spirit is constantly calling us into a heart of prayer before God. But here's what we can do as Christians. Once you become a Christian, the spirit comes to dwell inside of you. But we can quench and grieve the spirit constantly by pushing him aside and a hundred other things take precedence in our life. And the Spirit's constantly calling us into this kind of relationship with God where we move in and out of conversations with Him. So prayer should be a priority. 
And here's what I want you to see. We're going to look at this passage. So if you're there, I hope you're in Matthew chapter, chapter 6. We're going to look at all of it there, verses 5 through 15 here. Jesus begins to talk about prayer. And he lays out some very important teachings for us here that I don't want us to miss. So look at it with me if you would. Matthew chapter 6. Here's Jesus now teaching on prayer. He says this. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you have need of before you ask Him. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from, evil, from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So he gives us this lengthy teaching on prayer. And I think a lot of times we read that and we go, oh, well, you know, that's, that's a nice little ditty on prayer. And we gloss over it too quickly and we miss so much of the depth of what he's teaching in that passage. And I don't want us to do that. So I want to kind of lean into this and kind of dig into it just a little bit, kind of pick it apart some. Um, if anybody understood the importance of prayer, it was the Jewish religious leaders of Jesus's day. They had powerful, powerful ideas about prayer that they followed. Um, I was reading one of the commentaries today about this passage of Scripture, and this is kind of a lengthy thing, but I want you to listen to this because I think it's very interesting. We need to know that the, the, the Jews, the, the, the Israelites, even of, of Jesus' day, these religious, they had a very high idea about prayer. And I find that very challenging because sometimes we minimize the importance of prayer. We, we, we talk about it. We talk about how powerful it is, but we minimize it. Well, they never minimize the importance of prayer. Um, these, these Jews that Jesus is speaking to here, the religious, religious leaders that he's kind of confronting right here, they had a high ideal of prayer, and yet he said they were wrong in their approach to prayer. And I, I, I want to go, listen, if they were wrong in their approach to prayer, I better re-examine myself. I, I better check out where I am in my own prayer life. And so here's what Barclay wrote about this. He said, no nation ha ever had a higher ideal of prayer than the Jews had in Jesus's day. And no religion ever ranked prayer higher on the scale of priorities than did the Jews of Jesus's day. Great is prayer, said the rabbis of Jesus's day, greater than all other works one of the loveliest things that was ever said about family worship in the rabbinic writings was this. He who prays within his house surrounds it with a wall that is stronger than iron. The only regret of the rabbis was that it was not possible to pray all day long. So you see how prayer was a priority to them in that day. So he went on to say this. He said, there was prayer before and after every meal. There were, pr there were prayers in connection with the light and the fire and the lightning as on seeing new moons come, on comets that swept through the sky when rains or tempests came, at the sight of seas, lakes, or rivers, on receiving good news, on using new furniture, on entering or leaving a city. Everything had its prayer, and prayer pe pr pl played almost a without ceasing role in the life of the Jews of Jesus' day. Clearly, there is something infinitely lovely here. It was the invention that every happening in life should be brought into the presence of God. And yet, Jesus confronted their prayer lives. Now, when I read that, I went, whoa, what would he say about ours? 
I mean, they're praying constantly, right? Like it's, it's a part of their everyday life. And I think if Jesus confronted that, what would he say? I think he would say to us, yours is non-existent. Yours doesn't hold a candle even to the Jews that he confronted in his day. So mine is, my kind of concern as I'm reading this is like, how do we become this people of prayer that he's called us to? And, and I don't know, as I was working on this study, and I think this is the point at which I kind of decided maybe this needs to be a two-parter for us. Because I think we need to become a people of prayer that are really given to this topic. I, I, I think it's a powerful one for us to look at. And so I want us to kind of dig through this a little bit and the things that Jesus is teaching here and kind of pick it apart, kind of lean into it, kind of get what he's talking about. So the first thing I want to talk about is how Jesus in this passage, especially in verses 5 and 6, and we'll kind of lean into this some here for just a minute, but how he talks about how prayer for believers, prayer must be a spiritual discipline. And we kind of talked about that already a little bit um, in the reason we don't pray um, but, but I want to kind of lean into that a little bit more and, and kind of look what he says here. Look at verses 5 and 6 again, and I want you to notice something here. This is powerful. Here's what he says. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. What, who's he confronting there? The very ones who were constantly praying, Right? He's confronting them. So, so you see, what for they love to, to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that may be seen by men. Assuredly, he said, I say to you, they've received their reward. But when you pray, and he begins to tell us how, go into your room and when you have shut your door, pray to your father who's in the secret place and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Now, I don't know if you noticed this, but I pointed this out last time because there's some things for the life of a believer that Jesus said, ought to be a must. It's taken for granted that those will be a part of your life. But notice what he says in the first part of verse 5, also in verse 6. He says, when you pray. You see that? You might even want to circle that there in verse 5 when he says it. And when you pray. And when you pray. And then he says it again uh, just a little bit later. Um, if you kind of read on down, verse 6. But you, when you pray. It's not if you pray or if you happen to be in prayer, it's not if it comes to mind for you to pray, or if it's a priority to you to pray, or, or whenever this, it's, it's when you do it. So what's he saying? It's expected that you're doing this, right? And why wouldn't it be? Why, why wouldn't we as believers be spending time with this, this God who has revealed himself to us, who wants to be in relationship with us, um, why, why wouldn't we? So that's pretty interesting when you kind of look at that just on the face of it, that we are expected when you pray. Christ expects believers to practice this regular discipline of prayer. Now, um, think about this. Here's, here's a question I just want to throw out to you. What are some aspects of a regular disciplined prayer life? What does that look like? What, what are some of the attributes you think of a regular disciplined prayer life? What does that look like? Okay. A regular confession of sin. Okay. Yeah. Adoration. Yep. The, the acrostics that kind of spell out the things you ought to do as you move through prayer. Okay. I know, Marie, you had one you used to teach, right? You shared one with me one time. Acts, yeah, adoration, confession, okay. Anybody else? What is What exactly are the aspects of a regular disciplined prayer life? What, is that, what does that look like? Okay, journaling, okay. We're going to talk about that one a little bit because I want to get just as practical as we can about how we can develop this prayer life. Okay. I think that's very important. I've always said that we do a lot of talking in prayer, not much listening, and listening is a key component in prayer. Let me give you five aspects of regular and disciplined prayer life that we need to remember. And these are some things that I think Jesus is kind of hitting on here. Um, number one is this. Prayer takes time. 
just jot that down. Prayer takes time. Um, some of you kind of shared some thoughts a while ago that kind of went through my mind, and even some of the stuff I knew that was coming to study was kind of already, already kind of beginning to play through my mind, like I think that fits here. Um, like when um, some of you kind of talked about prayer being a priority or, or we don't make time for it, uh, you know, some of that kind of stuff. Or when Dean said we want to be entertained, right? Um, prayer takes time, if you think about it. Like with many disciplines, we have to take time to do it. Um, if you're going to pray effectively, we got to set aside times when we're going to do that. It has to become a priority. It usually means there's some other things that are going to have to be moved aside uh, for us to make it a priority. Um, yes, we're called to pray without ceasing. However, without set times of prayer, intimate prayer with God, our spontaneous prayers throughout the deep day probably aren't going to be very rich or very fluid. Having focused times of prayer will enhance our spontaneous praying through the day. I think it's important for Christians to have a set-aside time to pray. I think that's something that ought to happen in our life. And we used to talk about it, this as a discipline, the discipline of having a quiet time, the discipline of having time that you have set aside every day to spend time with Him in prayer. I think that's, that's key for us. Um, I don't know what works for you or what some things are that you have found helpful um, in your own prayer life. Um, I know Andre just mentioned journaling. I, I think that's a big one, writing out your prayers for some people. Um, I think that's really key. Um, there's other things like um, learning to pray scripture. Um, I, th I think that's important that you learn how to read God's word and to pray as you're reading and to, to make scripture a part of your prayers. Praying scripture is a really key one. Um, key devotionals that spark prayers for you. I think that's key as well. But one of the main things is to set aside time to do it, to make it a priority in your life. A couple of verses that I really love um, one of them is Psalm 119, 147. And there's a reason I'm sharing these with you and we'll kind of get into this. But Psalm 119, 147 says this, and I love this. It says, I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. Um, that's really key. And notice what time he prays. What's he, what's he gonna do? He's gonna start his day that way, right? I, I rise before the dawning of the morning and cry for help. I hope in your word. That's really key. And then here's another one from another psalm. This is from Psalm 5.3. It says this, your voice, shall, your, your voice shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning, I will direct it to you. I said, I said that wrong, guys. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning, I will direct it to you. I will look up to you. Once again, he kind of hits on a time to pray, does he? And it's in the morning. Have you ever noticed that a lot of people think having your quiet time needs to be in the morning that it needs to be a morning time why is that you think okay yeah how many of you are not a morning person <laughs> just honestly so so that's tough isn't it when you're not a morning person it's it's tough to to make that time your prayer time in the morning um, which may be exactly what God's calling you to, to make you more of a morning person, right? Um, but, but think about that. Um, it's important to give God time, to give him time. Um, Christ himself often got up early in the morning while it was still dark and went away to pray. Great time for us to pray. Another interesting thought to consider is often we don't pray because we don't feel like we have time to do that. Uh, we feel like there's too many other things. I've got a busy day ahead of me. I've got all these things to, and, and I heard someone say one time, if you don't have time to pray, if you're too busy to pray, you're too busy. And I've heard that. So here's what Martin Luther said. He used to say this, and this is a great quote that's shared often. I've read this in lots of places. He said this, I have so much to do today that I shall give. I'll ha I shall have to spend the first three hours in prayer. And he did that, disciplined in his life. I have so much to do today that I shall have to spend the first three hours in prayer. Um, if you're really busy, you need prayer all the more for that day, is, is what he's saying, that it needs to be a priority for. So that's the first one. The second one is this. Uh, prayer is often enhanced by having a quiet place where we regularly meet with God. 
Now, these are just some practical things, but I want you to think about this. Jesus alludes to this in here. Um, look, look at your Bible again and just kind of look what he says here in verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who's, who, who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in the secret place will reward you openly. There's a whole lot that's going on in that passage of Scripture, but this is kind of interesting. I think it's in, ha, that it's important for you to have a place where you meet with God regularly. Now, I'm going to kind of get personal here and kind of share a few personal things here, but um, I've moved around in my ministry uh, a lot uh, over almost 38 years now. I was kind of calculating today, like, how long have you been doing this? 1983 is when I started, so I'm getting ready to start on my 38th year. I'm getting old, okay? And, and we've, Nancy and I have moved around a lot. And here's the thing that I was thinking about today, and this is really true. Every time we've moved somewhere, there has been a restlessness within me until I find that place. And I always have to find it both wherever I'm living in my house, uh, and we lived in parsonages our entire married life until we came here, okay? So we lived in the people's house, I always say. <laughs> you know, it wasn't our own. Um, so I always had to find that place, both at my house and at the church. And until I found that place where I could meet with God, and I have them here. I have a place here in the church. I have a place at home where is my place where I meet with God, okay? And that's key for me. I don't know why. Some people say that sounds very superstitious to me, but it's important to me to have a place, okay? Now, I'm going to tell you a story about that. When I was pastor of my last church at Silo, I had a place at the church that I prayed that nobody knew about, and it was upstairs in one of the baptistry dressing rooms. Odd place to go, but it was right above my office at the time. And so on Sunday morning, I would get at the, go to the church really early, and I would go up into that place, and it was like a prayer closet to me. And so that's where I would pray every Sunday morning. Well, Sarah, you will remember this. We had a terrible jail system in Durant, Oklahoma. And prisoners were always breaking out, getting loose, right? And we'd had a jail break on Saturday night. And so uh, Saturday night, one of the guys in the church that runs the sound says, Brother Buddy, I'm going to go to the church early tomorrow and just kind of search the church out and kind of because our church was a commuter church it was way out in the country by the lake lake texoma and people commuted to it that sat out there all by itself we got broken into all the time there was i mean it was a great hiding place if you didn't want to be found so he was going to go and check that out i forgot all about that so i got to the church early went up into my prayer closet right in this thing and here comes quentin mcclary <laughs> in there to turn on the sound system for the morning and I'm trying to be as quiet as I can because I'm thinking I'm going to scare him to death. If I say one word, if I say, Quentin, I'm in here or anything, it's going to startle him. And so he came in, turned on his thing and left. And I went, OK, good. I didn't scare him. He didn't know I was here. It's fine. A little bit later, he comes back in and stops. He sensed somebody was in that room, flipped the light on and walked over and went, <laughs> pulled the curtain back and jumped so high, I scared him to death. He had no idea what was in there. So be careful where your prayer closet is. That's the answer. You can scare people to death. That was at Silo. I, squared, I, I scared Quentin McClary. He's hard to scare, too. He was an old retired Marine. So, um, but have a place. That's, that's the key is have a place. And, and I will just tell you that once you find that place where you can meet with God, it's, it's amazing the things that God will show you in that place, the things that God will begin to make personal to you. So I think it's important to give him time. It's important to find a place. And number three, prayer takes sacrifice. It takes sacrifice. You're going to have to dis decide right now that I'm going to make it a priority in my life. And it may mean that I'm going to have to give some things up. I may have to give up some sleep, some rest time. I may have to get up an extra hour early or an extra 40 minutes early, an extra 30 minutes early to be able to do that. But it takes discipline to do it. Um, all ministry takes some type of sacrifice. It does. Uh, putting something of yourself aside. And that's a part of the discipline of prayer and coming into his presence. It takes sacrifice. And then number three, and this is I'm number four, this one's important too, prayer flows out of a time in God's word. Always. Prayer and the Word of God go hand in hand. Um, you can't really have one without the other. I always think it's important to learn how to pray Scripture, but I think if you want to know how to pray and you want to hear God speak while you're praying, God's Word needs to be a part of that conversation. That's, 
that's how God will begin to speak to your heart, how you'll begin to hear him. And, and that's important. So make prayer flow out of your time in God's word. That's why we talk about having a quiet time where you're in his word, but you're also in an attitude of prayer. And now here's the fifth one. I know I'm having to go through these kind of quickly, but here's the fifth one. Prayer is enhanced when practiced corporately. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, private prayer is important. It's important that you have a place and a time where you get alone with God. But corporate prayer, when we come together and we pray, like when we pray on Wednesday nights, I don't care how many of us there are. There weren't very many of us here tonight at 6 o'clock for that prayer time, right? I, I don't know, Nancy, what, maybe how many? About 10 of us maybe were here. But where two or more gathered together in his name, he's there, right? And when two or three agree as touching anything on earth, it's done in heaven. That's what scripture says, right? And so I, I think that corporate element of prayer is important also, and it's enhanced. So uh, that becomes very powerful uh, for us. So it's got to be a discipline um, in our life. All right, I've got about five minutes to do this second one, and let's see if we can get through this, okay? So not only must it be a discipline, but second, think about this, believers have to be careful of wrong attitudes and practices in prayer. So there's some things that Jesus kind of hits on in this passage of Scripture that can actually hinder our prayer life. And I think some self-examination here becomes really key. I want you to see which kind of things you kind of pick up on in what Jesus says here. Look at your Bible there again. I'm just going to read verses 5 through 8. And I want you to see what kind of wrong attitudes or practices you see here that could impede or hinder our prayers. Here's what Jesus said. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to, to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they have the reward. But when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to the Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you need before you ask Him. Okay, um, there's a whole lot of teaching there, right? But what kind of things did you hear that reflected wrong attitudes or practices that could impede or hinder prayer? What did you see there? Anybody? What did you see in that passage that could impede or hinder prayer that Jesus hit on? Vain repetitions, okay? Yep, we're going to talk about that one and what that is. That, does that mean that we ask once and don't ever ask again? What is that talking about? That's a huge question about that passage of Scripture. What's he talking about with vain repetitions? We'll dig into that one some. What else did you see? What are some things that could impede or that were impeding their prayers. Yes, Marie. Pride. Yep, you saw that in there, didn't you? They were doing it to be seen, right? Just like they were giving their gifts, their alms. They were giving to people, but they were doing it in a way so they could get praise for it. Same with their prayer life, right? What else did you see? Anything else? So vain repetitions. There was a pride issue at play there. They're doing it to be seen by men. Anybody else? See anything else there? Let me give you these real quickly. Real quickly. So here's some things to be aware of in your prayer life. <laughs> things that could hinder or deter your prayers. Yeah. <laughs> Number one. Be careful of being self-conscious and others conscious in your prayers. Be careful of being self-conscious or other, others conscious in your prayers. Christ said that the hypocrites prayed standing in the synagogue in the street corners to be seen by others. Um, that's, that's key. Yes, we should consider others when praying, especially when praying in public. We should consider their needs and God's desires for them so that we can pray accordingly. However, we should not be praying with the intention of gaining their approval or for them to notice us in our prayers. Um, I think this is really key when we pray corporately. Um, think about this. A lot of times it's hard for us to pray in front of other people or to pray corporately. Why? Because we're worried about other people listening to us when we pray. And, and one of the things we have to realize is 
they're supposed to be praying right along with us. They should not be listening to you. You're talking to God. He's the only one you care about who's listening, right? And that's, that should be our, our heart and our attitude. So when we pray, it's not that we should be conscious of everyone else praying for us. We're inter- and I'm going to tell you that some of those folks who feel that way pray the most beautiful prayers I've ever heard. I'm touched deeply when a person like that that says, well, I'm, I'm really nervous to pray in front of other people because I don't want everybody to listen to me. That reflects something of a humble heart that's going to pray from a right heart attitude. And when they do get up there and pray, it blows you away at how genuine that prayer is. And what that person needs to realize is what a blessing they are because of that prayer. That, that's such a powerful thing. So that's number one. All right, I told you I was going to be fast. Let's go. Here's number two. Be careful of being thoughtless and heartless in prayer. Thoughtless and heartless. Verse 7 is where Jesus talks about, and Cindy, you mentioned this, do not use vain repetitions as the heathens do. Vain repetitions. Um, Yours might be translated as empty phrases, or one translation uses the word babbling repetitiously. Um, What's he referring to there? That's, that's kind of something that's often debated. Um, he's actually referring to a practice of where they were hoping to be heard by constantly getting louder and louder and saying what they were saying over and over in order to receive the praise of men. So their vain repetitions were in order that others would say how spiritual they are, how important they are. Look at their prayers, thinking that they're going to be heard because of their much praying, their vain repetitions. The truth of the matter is we should be persistent in our prayers. That's not what that's talking about. It doesn't mean we're to pray once and not again. Like the widow, we are to be persistent in our prayers before God, right? Constantly bringing our petitions before him, but not to be seen of others. And that's important when he talks about that. Our prayer should be thoughtful and from the heart always. And let me give you the last one, and then we'll close with this. The third one there. Be careful of needlessly long prayers, okay? We don't pray long prayers just so that we'll be heard. Look how spiritual they are. They pray long, eloquent prayers, longer than anybody else. That's not it. And all the heart of that is that, listen, when our heart's not right in our prayers, if we're praying so that others will take notice of us, or we'll talk about how spiritual they are and how they pray, or or how eloquent they are in their prayers, we've missed the blessing. We've missed the purpose of prayer, and that will hinder our prayers. All right, I'm going to stop there. We're doing this in two parts anyway, so we'll finish this one up uh, next time we're together. Thank you guys for coming tonight. Pray, pray, pray. Um, We're living in a day that needs the prayers of God's people. So let me lead us in a word of prayer, and we dismiss tonight. Father, thank you for this time in your word tonight. Thank you for... Uh, those who are gathered here, Lord, for our sweet time of prayer that we had earlier tonight. And God, what you're going to do uh, in the lives of each of those that we lifted up to you, thank you for that in advance. Uh, God, thank you that you don't just tell us to pray, but you give us instruction at, at what that ought to look like. God, create in us a hunger, God, to commune with you in prayer. Lord, help us to take the things that we've even heard tonight from your word, God, to begin to apply them to our lives. Lord, to look for that time in that place to set aside a moment to spend in your presence. And God, may you begin to grow us in our faith, God, through our prayers. And Lord, tonight as we leave this place, God, may we leave here rejoicing in you that you're a God who longs to spend time with us. Lord, thank you that you welcome us into your presence. Lord, and that your word says that we can draw near to God and that you will draw near to us. And we thank you for that. Lord, we love you. We praise you. Thank you for this time together tonight. It's in your name we ask these things. Amen.